Welcome to the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts about democracy, civic engagement, and civil discourse. In this feed, you will find a sampling of episodes from our podcast and the Democracy Group, as well as recordings from our events. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please visit democracygroup.org to find more like this. Now let's get to our featured episode. Guys, why don't we start just, uh, we still got a couple more minutes before before we even get to seven. What I'd love to be able to do is is get you guys to open up a little bit um, with some pre-talk banter about why it is that you guys joined um why it is that you guys uh, joined Fair Vote? Or I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know the story behind it. Maybe you guys are the founders. Can you guys just kind of mention about how you got involved in it? Uh, sure. Well, Fair Vote is actually celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Uh, and so Dave and I are not the founders, um, but we are both really happy to be here. Um, I, our, our key reform priorities are ranked choice voting and the Fair Representation Act, which is a form of proportional representation, also using ranked ballots. Uh, I, I got involved in this issue uh, when I started volunteering for a local campaign that was that was working on ranked choice voting. This was in Massachusetts. Uh, and I'm just really captured by this idea because it, it's the right mix of having real world positive impact and also being feasible in the short term, unlike some of the other priorities that a lot of us might be interested in. Uh, and so I, I've been at Fair Vote for a couple of years, and I've been really thrilled to come in and work on this issue professionally. It's, it's been great. Dave, what about you? How did you get involved in Fair Vote? Sure. I joined about five years ago. Um, I, had, I had written a book about partisan gerrymandering um, with the title that, uh, well, I guess I've already been swearing on here. Um, called Rat Eft, um, Why you, Your Vote Doesn't Count, about the last redistricting cycle. Um, and I had always sort of assumed that the solution to partisan gerrymandering was independent redistricting commissions. Uh, and it was in the course of reporting that book that I, I came across Fair Vote and began to understand the idea of multi-member districts and began to grapple with the idea that as big of a problem as redistricting is the fundamental problem is districting itself. Uh, single member districts, a winner take all that um, make those lines so important. And so once you understand that the solution is, is really, it's such an elegant and obvious solution. Once your eyes are open to it, you just, you just can't see anything else. Uh, and so I was really happy to um, uh, join about five years ago and, um, and work on these issues full time. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, Deb and David, about how you guys got started with the book. I do want to mention uh, to everybody, I mean, it's past seven o'clock, we're at 7.01, so we're going to formally kick off. And one of the things I want to kind of emphasize is that this is a space where we highly encourage people to be able to get involved, ask questions from our two guests that are Deb Otis and David Daly from Fair Vote. We're going to be talking about some different uh, different possibilities for reform, talking about how that affects as we kind of move into beyond primary season into the midterms, how that affects how we're going to vote different issues um, regarding just, you know, American democracy right now. So again, if you're interested in asking a question, there is a spot to be able to raise your hand. You do need to be on your phone to be able to speak. So if you're planning to be able to do that, please, you know, if you're on a computer, that's, I don't think you're able to actually be called as a speaker. Uh, so, but if you're able to use your phone, uh, just log into Twitter, into Twitter spaces, and you're able to kind of contribute and, and participate. So to kind of kick things off today, what I'd like to ask our, uh, our guests is as we kind of move into the midterms, as we're kind of wrapping up primary season, I'd be interested to know what is the state that has had a major reform in the past few years that you've really got your eyes on 
to be able to see what the actual effects are going to be on the midterm elections. Sure. Um, I can offer up a couple, and um, I know Deb will have thoughts on this as well. Um, I think one really interesting state to look at this year will be Michigan, where voters in 2018 passed an independent redistricting commission that was one of the the better constructed in the country. Um, and this is a state that really had some of the most gerrymandered maps in the nation, both for state legislature and for Congress. Um, and citizens really stepped forward and made that change. It was it was really a, a process driven by a 27-year-old woman named Katie Fahey, who, who founded a reform group over Facebook and um, it turned it into a redistricting, a revolution there. Um, and citizens drew maps that um, have been graded very highly for, for nonpartisanship um, and which really for the first time in years ought to create a situation where the party that wins the most votes will actually have a chance of um, controlling both branches of the state legislature as well as winning the most seats in the congressional delegation. There's two other states that I might add to that conversation. Uh, I would give a shout out to Alaska and Virginia. Uh, both of these two are using ranked choice voting uh, for congressional elections. Uh, and now I think one of the things to me that has defined this cycle of primary elections this year has been these crowded fields of candidates, meaning that a winner in these party primaries often emerges with much less than half of the vote. And, you know, in, in a democracy like ours, it shouldn't half of the vote be the lowest bar a candidate has to go for. Uh, we've been playing a game called fewest votes wins over at Fair Vote, looking at some of these elections where, where the winner comes out with, you know, only 30 percent support from primary voters uh, going into the general election. And so I, I, I shout out to Virginia and Alaska because of their use of ranked choice voting. Uh, in, in Virginia, it was just a few congressional districts. Uh, the Republican parties in a couple of these districts chose to use ranked choice voting to nominate their candidates. Uh, and we saw uh, more positive campaigning and we saw winners emerge who had broader support from that uh, from those party voters. So instead of emerging with, you know, just 30 percent of the vote, we're seeing majority winners come out of these primary elections. And so I, I love that use of ranked choice voting as a way to uh, uh, improve our party primaries. And so that's what's going on in Virginia. In Alaska, they're using ranked choice voting, but a, a different flavor of it. Uh, they are using open primaries, meaning all of the candidates compete together for a primary. No, uh, they're not separate Democrat and Republican primaries. And then the top four leaders from that primary, all of them advance to the general election. So this is a mix of candidates from different parties. And the voters get to use ranked choice voting among those finalists. And so it's a it's a different flavor of ranked choice voting, but it, it's another way of getting at this uh, primary problem and improving the congressional elections. So it, in a pretty messy primary season with a, a lot of chaos going on, those are a couple of states that, that stand out to me. So have you seen any like changes in the outcome from using ranked choice voting? Because that's always a question in people's minds. Like, does it just reconfirm who probably would have gotten elected anyway? Or do we actually see new different people being able to win elections in ways that we wouldn't normally expect? Uh, we often see ranked choice voting improving the diversity of the candidate fields and creating more opportunities for women and candidates of color, uh, both to enter as candidates and then also uh, more likely to win in ranked choice voting elections. So we're certainly seeing uh, these diversity impacts. Um, we also see more positive campaigning, more issues focused campaigning with, with a little less of this mudslinging. It, it's a way to kind of turn down the temperature a little bit in, in what is still a highly polarized environment here. Uh, candidates know that in order to win, they may need to rely on second choice preferences, third choice preferences, etc. And so they have less of an incentive to just attack their opponent. Instead, they're trying to connect with a broad base of voters. So we're seeing these changes um, both in what kind of candidates are running and winning and in how those campaigns are conducted. 
I think that's the key point, really, that in a ranked choice voting campaign, the winner always has the widest and the broadest and the deepest support. And as a result, you not only get a different kind of campaign, but you get a different kind of winner. Um, because those candidates had to reach out, they had to talk to more voters, and because it's not enough to run the kind of base strategy that might work in some of these crowded fields that we are seeing. Um, I mean, Oklahoma's a second. They had a primary in Oklahoma at the end of June, and there was an awful lot going on in our politics with the Supreme Court and January 6th Commission and everything else happening. So if you missed that primary, I certainly understand it. Um, 14 candidates running in a safe red seat in Oklahoma, which means voters had a lot of choice, right? But if voters can only pick one person, that choice almost works against them because they are trying to uh, cast a strategic vote, but there's no polls and they don't know who's in first, who's in second. Um, the winner there won with 14.7% of the vote. Um, and while he'll go into a runoff, 85% uh, of those primary voters preferred somebody else. The idea of winning an election with 14.7% just doesn't work. And in a ranked choice voting election, it sort of functions as an instant runoff. What we have found um, is that whenever there's a runoff, what you see is a dramatic decline in turnout uh, when you call voters back to the polls in addition to incurring the expense of that of that other election. There were, I'm stealing Deb's fair vote research here, but there have been 248 runoff elections um, for, uh, for Congress since 1994. And in 240 of those 248 elections, turnout has dropped, and it's dropped by an average of 38%. So when you think of that, when you look at the number of districts in the country where there's really no competition at all, and that party primary is all that matters, that's just too few voters to be picking a winner. So when I hear about ranked choice voting, a lot of times we're thinking about the general election and the way that it could affect general elections where independents may have a better chance to be able to compete with major political parties or even third parties may be able to compete. But what I'm hearing from you is that ranked choice voting may have an even bigger impact within party primaries because party primaries are determined by such just small and razor thin pluralities. Um, where, like you said, somebody could win with 14% of the vote, or rather did win with just that small percent of the vote. Am I hearing that right? Like, do you think primaries are the area that they could have an even bigger impact than even in general elections? I think it could have a, a huge impact in different ways on both. Um, what we see right now, and Fair Votes Monopoly Politics report really laid this out, earlier this year, um, you know, finding that, that there's about 9% of U.S. House races that are actually competitive. We can call the other, you know, almost 400 seats right now. Um, and when that's the case, the primary is all that matters. And what we keep seeing around the country, you know, uh, on both sides of the aisle, Oklahoma's second with 14.7 percent, but but also races in Kentucky and Ohio and North Carolina and the you know in the low 20s and the in the low 30s for a winner. Um, but then when you move into the fall um, and you're looking at a general election, certainly um, the calculus becomes different. If you are an independent candidate, you are still able to run without everybody calling you a spoiler. Um, if you would prefer to vote for a third party candidate, you can. Um, I mean, certainly the, the big example of this is in Maine, where in the first usage of ranked choice voting there uh, for the U.S. House, you had um, um, in the first round, you had a Republican incumbent win the first round with about 48 percent. 
uh, followed by a Democratic challenger with about 46, 47 percent and uh, two independent candidates with, uh, you know, really low numbers. But uh, 48 percent isn't enough to win in a ranked choice race. And when they went to the second choices, uh, the the Democratic challenger actually won that race. Um, and that is really a good thing for democracy. Not that the Democratic candidate won, uh, but that 50% of the voters had their say, that every voter who wanted to express their preference to its fullest had that opportunity, um, and that independent candidates were able to run and have their voices heard, and that that the race was about ideas rather than who's a spoiler. I'd like to take a second and just remind everybody who's listening that you can become a participant. If you have a question for our guests at Fair Vote, feel free to just raise your hand. We can make you a speaker. You do need to be using your, um, you do need to be using the Twitter app on a phone rather than on a desktop computer to be able to ask questions, but we do encourage audience participation. So feel free to uh, to get out there, raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll get to you, you know, at any one of the breaks, you know, we'll step in and allow you to be able to ask the question. Oh, looks like uh, Jenna is requesting to ask a question. Here. Brandon, are you able to? Hey, Justin, are you there? Oh. Justin, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can All hear right. you, Jenna. Sorry. Go for it. Sorry, uh, I had a glitch there uh, when I got the uh, microphone. But um, you, this question might already be uh, on your list, so I apologize if I'm taking it from you. But I, I wonder, uh, Dave and Deb, how how you sell the parties on these these approaches that you've been talking about well, you know uh, ranked choice voting and in particular it seems like it is um perhaps at odds with some of what we traditionally perceive as as party incentives or just the way that the process has run and thinking about these you know not unlike a lot of lo other large organizations being resistant to change or or slow to change so how do you how do you make the case that the, to the parties that this is in these types of reforms are in their interest? That's a great question. And, and that's going to be a, a crucial component of keeping up this incredible growth that we've seen so far with ranked choice voting. Um, I, I think for parties, it's, it's very important that they can produce a strong nominee from their party primaries. They want a nominee who has broad support from their party voters, rather than somebody who comes out of one of these really fractured crowded contests where maybe it got really negative and so you you get a tarnished nominee with only a small number of voters behind them and then what do you have you have reluctant party voters who may be less likely to show up for the general election because of the of the bruising and hotly contested primary uh, and so I, I, the parties are interested in using this method that helps get them to the nominee with the broadest and deepest support. It helps the parties put that best foot forward going into the general election where they have a strong candidate who is well prepared to really speak to the voters' issues uh, going into November. Thanks so much, Jenna, for uh, stepping forward and asking a question. If any other listeners would like to be able to step forward and ask a question of fair vote. We highly encourage you to be able to do that. Um, we'd love to be able to get as much participation as we possibly can from, uh, from our listeners. Um, with that said, um, I'd like to ask a follow-up for uh, fair vote. What is, if, if there's such a benefit to being able to, for parties to being able to embrace ranked choice voting, What's really holding them back? Is it just the the sense of not wanting to uh, to make change at all, or is there something else? I'm not sure much is holding them back. I think this is really on the move. I mean, I think if you were to look at electoral reforms that have got the most momentum behind them, ranked choice voting would be right at or near the uh, very top 
of that list, um, when you look at what's happening in Alaska right now, when you look at what's happening in Maine, when you look at the, you know, four uh, 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 primary states that used it on the Democratic side back in 2020, the New York City mayoral's race uh, used RCV. You've got a, you know, um, more than a dozen uh, cities in Utah. This is really happening all over the country. Um, and Republicans in in 2021 in Virginia looking for the best nominee who would unite a, a fractured a party and try to win a race that they hadn't won in a long time, used RCV to select their a nominee for governor. Um, and they were not only able to, you know, choose Glenn Youngkin th through this process, but they, Republicans in Virginia uh, talk about how they never came out of a primary process more unified behind a candidate, that all the various wings of the party felt that they had been heard and had an opportunity to have their, uh, their voices and votes count. Um, and they emerged together and they won a race that, uh, in a state where they had not won statewide you know, in more than a decade. And I think those are the kind of victories that can tell parties this is really in your interest. And um, I think that's happening. One of the other reforms that you mentioned earlier um, involved uh, elements of proportional representation. I'd like to give you guys a moment to be able to explain how you'd like, how you envision that being implemented throughout the country. Because obviously, like there's there's parts of it that you have limitations based on what the constitution, or even on the state level, the state constitution say you can do. What is it that that you'd envision that we'd be able to have to get closer to something resembling proportional representation in the United States? So one of our top priorities is called the Fair Representation Act. And so this would implement uh, the, the system that we want for congressional elections. And this can be done by an act of Congress. Uh, this does not need a constitutional amendment. And so the Fair Representation Act would transform our country. So instead of having single winner congressional districts, the districts would all get larger and each larger district would elect multiple members of Congress. And so we call those multi-member districts. Uh, my friend Dave here is from Massachusetts, so I'm going to use his state as an example real quick. Uh, they currently have nine districts. So they have nine representatives, one from each district. Under the Fair Representation Act, Massachusetts could instead have three larger districts that elect three each. So they would keep their nine members of Congress, but each one would be coming from a, a larger district where they would have a couple of other members from that same district. Uh, and one of the things this would achieve is that almost all districts would be likely to elect at least one Democrat and at least one Republican. Uh, right now, a huge number of voters are uh, what we call locked out of representation. They live in a district that is safe for one party, but they support the other party. And so they feel like they have no chance of ever electing someone who will represent their interests in Washington. And the Fair Representation Act gets this proportional balance uh, in both large states and small states by going from single member districts to multi-member. There are a lot of Republicans in the state of Massachusetts. I know that because I live there. And if you just look at it, Massachusetts has had one Democratic uh, governor since the days of Michael Dukakis back in the late 1980s. So there's plenty of Republicans that live there, but Massachusetts has not sent a Republican to Congress since 1994. That's a pretty long time to have, you know, a y unanimously blue delegation. Uh, imagine if that were different. I mean, imagine if we had New England Republicans in Congress. Imagine if on the other hand, all of those Democrats in Oklahoma and Kansas and um, other states where the delegations are solidly red, but, you know, there's a Democratic governor in Kansas. Um, so um, it is not as if these states are monoliths. Um, 
you would see a very different United States Congress in which the incentives for the members would be quite different once they were elected. I think you would see more bridge builders that you might see a return to the days where uh, folks could actually go to Washington, perhaps, and um, work together and try to get things done. And this solves gerrymandering also. Uh, because you're drawing fewer lines, we've eliminated half of the problem. But there's some great research showing that no matter how you draw the lines under the Fair Representation Act, you end up with fair partisan representation nationwide, uh, because you, you can't get this same advantage from tinkering with the lines, uh, you know, moving, moving a community from one district into another one. Since it's no longer winner take all, since it's proportional, you get fair outcomes regardless of how these lines are drawn. And so we could do away with a, this uh, really contentious yeah. process. I think that's right. And I, I guess I would just expand, when we talk about gerrymandering, so often we're thinking about the states that have been most toxically and extremely gerrymandered over the course of uh, the last decade or so. So we're talking about North Carolina or Texas or Maryland, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, and so it, it's certainly a problem it, it, in those states. But in places like Massachusetts and Oklahoma and Kansas, Almost no matter how you draw the lines, you are going to get the kind of unanimous single party delegations that you're seeing now that do not fairly and adequately r represent the political uh, uh, spectrum in those states. So we have to talk about how we fix the gerrymandering problem in those purple states that, that have been rigged for one side or the other. But we also have to talk about how folks in how Republicans in blue states and Democrats in red states are able to have a fair representation as well. And this does that. Again, I want to encourage anybody who wants to ask a question to just request to speak and we'll try to include you. We'll promote you in as a speaker just to be able to ask your question. Um, and again, we encourage audience participation to be able to get involved. So feel free to join in the conversation by asking a question to fair vote yourself. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to go ahead and just kind of, oh, Olivia requesting, uh, Brandon, can you bring, uh, Olivia in? Hello. Hi guys, I'm Olivia. Um, so I know you guys mentioned Virginia a couple times tonight. I am from Virginia and I was wondering how ranked, why you think ranked choice voting has helped the state of Virginia and what it could do for our future elections in Virginia. Well, so far, the folks in Virginia using ranked choice voting are uh, the Republican Party, um, but they also passed what's called a local options bill um, a couple of sessions ago. And this gives cities and towns the option to opt in to ranked choice voting without having to go through a complicated process in order to make that change. And so one of the things that, that we're looking forward to seeing in Virginia um, now that this is law is more cities starting to use RCV for their municipal elections. Uh, and of course, this can uh, give voters more voice and more choice in the process. It can improve diversity and it can create a better campaign cycle. And so in addition to congressional elections, uh, in Virginia specifically, because the legislature passed this law, we're looking forward to some local implementations too. Thanks so much, Olivia, for joining in. Again, if anybody else has questions, feel free to request to speak. We make it really easy for you to be able to join in on the conversation. Um, I'd like to follow up on Olivia's question. Um, why is it that Democrats haven't joined in yet? I mean, a lot of times we think about voting reform being a Democrat issue. So it's even surprising that the Republicans move forward on it. In fact, it's kind of heartening that maybe that this really is truly a bipartisan issue that could have even more momentum than we've already seen. Is there any expectation that Democrats are going to do the same over in uh, Virginia? In Virginia, I, I don't know. Uh, we certainly hope so. There's a, 
a big reform movement that is underway in Virginia right now on this issue with, I imagine, many Democratic supporters. But if you look around the country, this has been a reform that has been embraced by Democrats. It's been embraced by Republicans. It's been embraced by independents and third parties. Um, I mean, it's not Republicans may have used it in Virginia and Utah, but in New York City, the the uh, Democratic primaries uh, last year, including the the hotly contested mayor's race, uh, used ranked choice voting. Um, certainly, we are seeing this in Maine, uh, which is a state that's had a long and proud tr- tradition of third parties um, and and voters who really want to be able to weigh multiple candidates uh, without feeling like they are are going to elect a spoiler uh, that uh, two thirds of of voters don't want to see in office. So this has been a nonpartisan reform. Democrats uh, certainly used it, you know, in several states in 2020 in the presidential primary process. Um, And so I, I would say it's, 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 it has support across the political spectrum. No, definitely. It certainly seems to have support across the political spectrum, as you mentioned. Just to kind of wrap things up, because we're kind of coming up on 7.30 at this point, I'd like to give you guys both a chance to be able to say one thing that you hope to see in this next midterm election cycle. Like, is there a referendum on the ballot? Are there certain candidates that are really pushing certain types of voter reform that are running um, you know, campaigns this this cycle? What is it that you're really hoping to see this this midterms in in 2022 as you're kind of watching the election cycle as it's kind of upcoming um i well i would say i, I want to say two things i hope you'll give me the, the leeway for two here so you, you asked if there are referendums coming up and there are um the state of nevada as well as a number of cities are voting on this this november uh so we're looking at there's ranked choice voting campaigns going on in seattle uh Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine. I have to hope they both win because I sure don't want to have to pick a favorite Portland. Uh, (laughs) Fort Collins, Colorado, Evanston, Illinois, a number of counties as well. So we're seeing these uh, state, city, and county campaigns that we're keeping a close eye on and we're really excited for. Um, The other thing that I want to see at this time is for more candidates and organizations to start making this reform one of their priorities. A lot of groups maybe are already have this on their list of priorities somewhere. A lot of candidates already support ranked choice voting to some degree. Uh, I think we're at the time where we are ready for this solution. And I want to see this elevated in the narrative uh, from from individual voters demanding this of their uh, candidates and city councils and elected officials. I want to see this from candidates on the campaign trail. And I want to see this from other reform organizations uh, joining us in this uh, in this campaign. I think Deb has got all of those races exactly right. Um, so I would just say that I've got my eye on a couple of cases that are at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, this fall, just ahead of the midterms. Um, you've got a really crucial case involving the uh, Voting Rights Act and congressional maps in Alabama, um, Milligan versus Merrill, uh, that is really a, a textbook uh, Section 2 claim in the past. Um, you have eight districts, excuse me, seven districts in Alabama. The, the state is uh, just under 28% black voters. Um, so it ought to be ideally two of seven districts, except it's only been one because of the way that those maps have been drawn. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court um, effectively put a halt to a new map in Alabama after a lower court found that to be a Voting Rights Act violation. Um, And my guess would be that this court has a record uh, of narrowing the Voting Rights Act over the course of the last decade. Um, I think that this is yet another example of where multi-member districts and proportional representation would step in and solve a problem um, if you had multi-member districts in Alabama, you would not have, um, you would not have, 
uh, seven white districts and one black district, you would actually see an outcome that was proportional, and you would get that outcome without um, without the use of race in drawing lines, which is something that this court has been has been frowning on. And then, of course, also they're taking up the independent state legislative uh, doctrine in a case out of North Carolina, uh, which could lead to the end of independent commissions um, for uh, redistricting purposes around the nation. And so, again, uh, I think it's time that reformers really take a look at the Fair Representation Act and multi-member districts as a solution for redistricting, but also a solution for courts that have been narrowing the kind of options and remedies that have been used over the course of the, the last several decades. Well, thank you both so much. Before we go, I want to give a shout out to Jenna Spinelli. She is both a co-host of the podcast Democracy Works, as well as the host of the new podcast, um, When the People Decide. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just kind of promote my own podcast, Democracy Paradox, if you get a chance to be able to listen to that. These are all three, some of the podcasts that are available as part of the Democracy Group. We've got a whole host of different podcasts available please check us out as well as join the democracy group uh, community on Twitter, where you can find out more information about the podcast and just kind of keep in the loop about some of the events and some of the different topics that we're discussing at the time. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us before we go. I want to reach out to just ask fair vote one last time. Where is it that we can find out more about yourself and find out more information about Fair Vote as we move forward. You can find us online at fairvote.org. And I ought, to, I ought to call Matt in here to talk about all of our social media feeds. Yeah, so we have a Facebook page, a Twitter, which you can find by clicking on our profile picture here. Uh, we also have LinkedIn and my Instagram and my personal favorite is YouTube where we have lots of really interesting long form conversations like this one. Well, thank you so much. My name is Justin Kemp. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you guys probably next month when we host another Twitter spaces. Feel free to reach out to us and communicate to us about other topics you'd like to hear and feel free to reach out to us about different times, just different ideas and anything else. Uh, that we can be able to uh, to talk more to you guys about. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode from the Democracy Group. If you want more podcasts like this, then visit democracygroup.org. There you will find our events, topics, and a newsletter as well. So head on over to democracygroup.org.